So while, while we're setting this up, just in the interest of time, let me introduce the panel. Uh, we have uh, Anka Anbu, Albu from uh, Kai Ventures, uh, Catherine Hill from Tedco. Hi, Catherine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Lina Odershedi, I hope I did that justice to it, and Jennifer Adi. Um, so, how's her uh, do? Who's the moderator? I don't know. I can be. I think I'm I should. I was not informed, but sure. Let's go with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just okay. I don't know. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel. Apparently, I'm the moderator, which I just found out, so I did not come prepared with questions. Uh, but I think it's a good fact that I'm a curious person by nature, so I can always come up with a lot of questions. <laughs> and I am positive that the ladies are well prepared. It is a great pleasure to be here on an all-female panel of investment, which is very cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining, despite the lovely weather outside and all the other sessions that are happening. How am I doing so far? Very good. <laughs> okay, great. So we are going to discuss today about investing in quantum technologies. And I would love for you ladies to introduce yourselves briefly, your experience, who are you working with, what type of investments you're doing. Sure, I'll start. So I'm Catherine Hill Ritchie, and um, I kind of wear two hats. So as you can see there, um, Tedco is the state of Maryland's venture capital fund. I grew up in Maryland, didn't even know we had one. It's 25 years old, it's evergreen, and we invest in technology broadly, but it's agnostic. So it's everything from B2B SaaS to medical devices. Obviously, we get spin outs from you know, NIH and Johns Hopkins and National Cancer Institute, so we do have a lot of healthcare. Um, I would say, though, that what I'm proud of about this portfolio is we do have a, um, a bucket of capital for very early stage pre-seed founders that are called SETI, so that's socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, So, uh, which, as you know, women and people of color have, but also it includes disability, uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ and veterans, because, you know, there are a lot of people that can be disadvantaged. So no offense to all the white guys in the room, but this is a way to get kind of help in even the playing field a little bit, especially because pre-seed dollars are some of the most difficult to come by. So, but uh, there are three buckets. I actually have the later stage, so I do series A and up, and I am agnostic. So that earlier bucket has some requirements, but mine is agnostic. But I also spent 23 years in finance and investing. I worked for four billionaire family offices, and I'm also an angel investor. So I do also advise families um, on investing, and I love to come to places like this to meet new companies and have new ideas. Just so you know, the Tedco only invests in companies that have a headquarters in Maryland, so that's the only thing. So if it's outside of Maryland, I could still talk to you, but uh, it wouldn't be for Tedco unless you plan to move to Maryland. So uh, that's about a, bit, a bit about me. Thank you. So I'm Lina Odershede. I'm from Copenhagen, where I serve as senior vice president in the Novo Nordisk Foundation. So I personally mostly invest in fundamental research in the natural and technical sciences. More specifically, we have a lot of effort in quantum and also in data science and AI. The Novo Nordisk Foundation is a so-called private enterprise foundation. That means that the foundation, which is charitable, owns companies which are for profit. So the largest of these companies is Novo Nordisk AS, which is um, yeah, the 15th largest, largest company in the world by market cap. That's also the largest one in our portfolio then another 170 companies, of which most are located in the US. Also, so to manage the assets of the foundation, there is Novo Holdings, which is our investment branch. So I also uh, actually advise for the investments of Novo Holdings, in particular in quantum. And here, actually, my background as a professor of physics uh, comes in handy, actually, because it's not an easy space to invest in. Yeah, I think I'll stop here for now. Hello, my name is Jennifer Addy. I am the COO of Mach 37, which is an accelerator for early stage startups. And I'm also COO of our parent company, VentureScope, which does a lot of investments in them as well. 
Uh, Mach 37 uh, was established by the state of Virginia, very much sort of with funds like TEDCO to be a regional economic development organization. However, we took it over in 2017 and started commercializing it in 2018. So we're the only accelerator out of a state of Virginia that has gone commercial. And we've been pivoting beyond just cybersecurity to look at cyber and cyber adjacent technologies. We've had a number of quantum early stage companies come through our accelerator, uh, one of which actually was here last year for the startup competition and, and Scilab Systems actually won runner up, so we were very pleased to be present at the conference. But one of the things we're looking at is that early stage segment where people are trying to transition from deep tech to emerging tech and make that, that middle, middle ground leap. And so we have an accelerator program that helps early and growth stage companies do that. And then we also have a very robust tech scouting team that looks internationally at what's happening within the very early stage sector. Think Gardner reports pre-Gardner uh, timeline. And so we produce uh, and, and, and you know, sell those as well for our different market segments. And Quantum has been one of the ones that is of the highest demand. So we have a lot of discussion around that. Thank you. And for those that are not familiar with Kai Ventures, uh, my name is Anka Albu. I am the CMO and head of VC platform for QAI Ventures. We say Kai Ventures uh, for quantum and AI. Uh, we are based in Switzerland, in Basel. Uh, we position ourselves as an ecosystem developer uh, that uses the tools of a VC fund and a startup accelerator to grow the quantum industry, to, to support the businesses that come out of the lab, and we help them all the way to IPO, as my t-shirt says. Uh, that's, that's our goal, really. So we work with academia, we work with corporates, we work with uh, governments, but we do have private money, and we invest globally. We have no restrictions, and uh, we invest also in all uh, areas of quantum technologies, in computing, sensing, and networking or communication, however you want to call it. Um, yes. So we started last year in March. That's when we were founded. Uh, by now, we are already raising our second fund. We invested in 17 companies so far from six different countries, I believe. And uh, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, before, uh, before my job with Kai Ventures, I was the managing director of the Swiss ICT Investor Club. And uh, it grew to be one of the largest and most active angel investor networks in Switzerland. And joining the quantum industry, has been very exciting. There's so much stuff happening. There's so many technologies, so many potential innovations, right? Um, it's, it's quite exciting. So the first question, what do you look for first when you are looking to invest into a tech company? And from what I understood, neither of you is really focused on quantum like we are. So you do technology agnostic. Um, okay, so let's maybe take a step back. What would a quantum company need to have in their product or in their pitch so that they can convince you to look at them and consider investment? Well, I'll start first just because I'm closest. So, you know, it's funny because my mom and dad were both research scientists, PhDs at NIH. So I grew up running around labs. And, um, and then my mom did this weird thing. She left and worked for a VC-backed firm, which I didn't understand. I was like 12 at the time. But now I look back, and it kind of prepared me for my job today. And uh, that business, unfortunately, failed. Uh, but it taught me a lot of lessons, and I apply that today. What am I looking for? So what I think is interesting is I've met people who are technologists and researchers and scientists and all of that who are fantastic and intelligent but they love tinkering. So we can't invest in a science project. And sometimes there are people who are incredibly brilliant, but uh, some of them can speak business and invest speak, but some of them can't. So if, you know, I'm trying to be educational here because people obviously have companies and startups and they need to be funded. And so you have to make sure you talk the investor language because sometimes uh, you can get so deep down a rabbit hole that 
it kind of alienates the investor because the investor wants to help you and maybe we're not an expert in that area, but we have money to get you to your goal. So you have to think of it more of a collaboration, but you also have to realize that it can't be a, a science project. There has to be goals and milestones to commercialization because with, out of that, we're not gonna get any of our money back. And that's the point of investing, right? So unlike loans and grants with other departments do, this, we're looking for our capital back. So, and that's not just with the state of Maryland, that's also family offices. Unless it's a philanthropy bucket, you know, we have to be able to, you have to show us your vision to how you're gonna get to some exit IPO acquisition. So, I think for, for the activities that, that I hit up, actually one of the most important thing is the purpose. So there has to be a greater purpose of investing in this particular company or person. There has to be a, a vision, like a great vision, something that can really move the world in a particular area. Um, it has to be ambitious, it has to be scalable, um, and of course, there has to be a, a convincing uh, business plan. Uh, and also, the question of who is the person fronting this is extremely important. So uh, preferably, it should be somebody who has somehow skin in the game, I would say, and who, who of course, would need the, the knowledge, the background to do this, but would also need to have the, the business mind. And um, you talk about uh, academics, <laughs> and I would say it, it would be rare, but it does exist that you can find an academ academic who, who is able to do this, but it, it, it's, um, it's a different mindset, actually. So, um, yeah, these are the things that I would be uh, looking for. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Yes, yes, and to everything they've said, I think we all share a lot of viewpoints on that. One of the things that we look for in most emerging tech is the ability to understand product market fit in order to scale and be able to understand the volume of the problem. When people talk Tam Sam Som, uh, a lot of times it's miscalculated, it's not re very research-based. We look for companies who have done their research, have connected with the market and connected with potential customers and gotten that feedback. We use that lean startup approach with the, the companies that we accelerate and we force them to go talk to the market. We'll tell you that all information is ephemeral. You can ask one quantum expert and they'll know a piece and another quantum expert and they'll know a piece. And if we see companies who have put those pieces together and really started understanding the landscape to the point where they're leading parts of it, that's a very good sign. The other part of it is, is the tech real? This is particularly important for quantum. A lot of people are very uncomfortable talking quantum. I mean, they're even uncomfortable talking cyber half the time, and that's been a market for decades, right? But when you talk quantum, people say, is this is this for real? Does this really work? How can we trust this? And there aren't that many technical advisors who can actually go and validate it, and that's another big thing. The last thing I'll say is team. So to your point, making sure you have someone who can, can actually bring the, the, the company to success and work together and learn from the people who are advising them rather than kind of create the plan and go heads down and try and run through brick walls. You know, be flexible, be able to work together through a lot of ups and downs. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, so definitely team is one of the top things that we look at first. If the team doesn't work as a team, the technology can be amazing. It will still fail. This is something that has been well known in the tech world, in the startup world, and we approach this in a similar way. Uh, the team is still very important, even in quantum. Then the second part is the technology. Um, this is also very important because I personally am a huge science fiction buff and, uh, you know, I would love to believe that we can invent anything, uh, but it's not always the case, right? So what we did, actually, because it is difficult to find quantum advisors and experts, we actually hired, we, we 
stole a quantum physicist from the German government who was doing investments for them. So we hired our own quantum physicist, and whenever we are doing due diligence or we look at a project, uh, we work with him, of course, you know, like, Tobias, is this science fiction or is it doable? Um, and also we work with other quantum physicists and we always validate the projects that we are looking into deeper with actually quantum experts. And we have a, a really good global network of quantum experts and mentors that work with the startups that help them develop the business skills. And I guess with this, I, would, um, I have quite a few points here that I would like to go deeper into. And since the team is so important for all of us, uh, you know, like we, we are a very experienced team in Basel. Uh, we also opened an office in Canada, in Calgary. Uh, so now we expanded this year. And we all have worked for more than a decade individually with the startup world from different parts of the world, in different countries. In, um, and I would say that um, a quarter of our team has been, uh, they are experts in fintech. They work with the six bank, with Swiss banks, with insurance, and had their own projects. Um, and you know, when, when we started doing Kai Ventures, like, okay, you know, we know what we're doing. Let's just like copy paste and do an accelerator. It's like, no, that doesn't work that way, right? Because like you said, Lena, it's a very different mindset, right? For the team and for the, the people that start projects in quantum technologies. So we had to adapt, we had to, you know, we always learn as well, we are a startup ourselves and like, okay, what we can do actually to support the quantum scientists that are creating these projects into being more business oriented. And it is indeed a mindset, but my question would be for you, um, do you think they can transition into becoming commercial oriented? And what would it take to, to get them out of the lab and really make them into salespeople or CEOs? Very different skill sets. I agree. But, you know, I think you hit on something that's really important, which are advisors. Because um, a lot of startups, you know, everyone's struggling with funding. And today's environment is really tough. So you may not need people full time. But to kind of strengthen you to have scientific advisors, but business advisors too. I mean, there are tons of people out there who've had exits and it doesn't even necessarily need to be in your direct industry, but uh, it could be around, you know, it could be anything in, in cyber, in, in AI, in, in anything, in FinTech even, because a lot of times it, the particular science uh, uh, may be slightly different, but your pathway is gonna be the same way. So that's a way where you can get someone's brain share. And, you know, think about it today. Uh, there's a lot of people who are, you know, we've got our, um, our gig economy, and there are a lot of people who have more than one job. And so, you know, kind of uh, getting that brain share for shares or, you know, if you cash, but that's another way to do it. So you don't have to, it's just not your existing team, but also get advisors who actually do something for you. I see sometimes companies, and they have some famous names and that person never does anything for the company. You think, oh, wow, so-and-so is on you know, an advisor, but they've never called up another VC or anything. So you also want your advisors to work for you, but to get them to do that, you've got to pay them somehow. So it's equity or cash. And so that's a business idea, but it, it, it really helps strengthen you. So that's one thing that I see that has worked if you may not have that training or skill set is to buy that skill set. Yeah, I think actually my ideal CEO is uh, Jensen Huang, who started out as an engineer, an expert, a technical nerd, but then still had the capacity to build his own company and become the CEO of one of the most uh, amazing companies that exist. So yes, it's possible, but how many are there of them? <laughs> Maybe not so many, right? So I would say that um, once in a while, I guess you would encounter an inventor who maybe comes with the academic background, but does have the mindset or is willing to learn. I think it's really important, as maybe you said, to be willing to learn, to, to have a new mindset that is uh, aimed at, at business. Uh, and so I think some, once in a while, yes, we encounter people who has that mindset and who can do it. Uh, but if you say come from academia and you're an entrepreneur that originates from academia, you really need to be open to advice and to 
also be you know in a team with people who have skills that are different from yours and to really respect and uh, acknowledge those skills as being equally important as the skills you have from academia. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's doable. But of course, sometimes it, it makes more sense to have a, a different CEO of the company. So I guess it, it, it would depend on, on the exact situation. You asked, you know, can they make the transition? We've worked with almost exclusively technical founders for a decade and a half from all over the world. We've seen many make the transition very successfully. Part of it is what they want out of that technology. Do they want to just prove that it works? Do they actually want to build it and have it implemented somewhere? Do they want the whole world to use it? The, the strategic level of their viewpoint and how they view their project is important to their, the, their intrinsic drive to make it happen and get it to scale. A lot of times, the science project viewpoint is, OK, I proved it works. Does someone else want to take this over? And, and we've seen that successfully happen as well. There's a lot of tech um, transition and things like that that's happening. But at the end of the day, unless they have a team that's strong enough to do it, and also the connections and the support from whether it's advisors or investors, it's very hard to kind of drive that, that path alone. So uh, most of the ones that have been successful, at least from early stage that we've seen, is they came in as technical founders, they may have led for a bit, maybe then shifted to CTO, or, and then brought in some folks who can just pick up the business side and collaborate well. The other thing that we see is um, we've worked with a number of labs, national labs, and, and where you have amazing scientists who say, I wanted to be a scientist. And so we're doing a lot of reverse pitches now where we take entrepreneurs who just love doing startups, they've done five, they're serial entrepreneurs, and bring them in and say, hey, does this tech look interesting to you? Would you like to pick up this ball and run with it? There's actually a lot of that out there. And so the more that we can blend the ecosystem to your point where you have so many different sort of verticals where you have academics and government and big business and the startups and the investors, getting on the same page, that alignment is critical. And that's why the problem is important. So if they're thinking at scale and it's a critical problem, those ducks can usually line up. Thank you very much. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I do believe that it can, like there are trainable skills, right? Uh, to be a CEO, to, be, to start learning sales. Um, and I, my, my partner, he's a very introverted technical person and now he's doing sales and he's doing amazing because he really believes in the product, right? He really wants to bring it to the world and make everybody use it because it will improve their lives. So I think this is very important when you, when you start thinking about why would you take your project out of the lab into the market? Is it because you want to contribute to the world? Is it a personal challenge? Like I, I think it takes some, some self-awareness and some thinking about why. Um, and based on that, you can make the decision and then go from there, right? The curiosity, the learning, the purpose, everything that you, you ladies mentioned are very important. Um, and actually, I was surprised a little bit yesterday during the pitch competition. I don't know how many of you were there, some of you, including the, the guys that pitched. And thank you for pitching, by the way. It takes a lot of courage. Um, and I was surprised that mo not most, but pretty much all of them didn't really focus on the commercial aspect. Uh, they were very technical. They were very focused on the products, on you know, the solution that they are building technically, which is amazing, and it's normal, I think, at this stage. Uh, but at some point, we will need to, to transition and do more education, and this is on all of us, right? On doing more education on how to present your product in a commercial viable way. You know, have you done customer validation? And of course, you, you will not have the technology ready. Nobody does. Uh, but at least the, the potential or the purpose of your technology, is, is it usable? Will companies use it? You know, did you talk to banks if you're going for that market? Um, you know, you, yeah, the customer validation for technical founders. How does that work? How do we start this education from the, the lab, basically? To, to have them start thinking in a commercial way, right? 
take this first. <laughs> so, okay. so talk about, doesn't it then? Yeah, but it's so, how to make. The question was how to make, uh, say, scientists start thinking in a commercial manner. Yeah. So I think one way to, yeah, I think one, actually one motivation. So usually if you go into academia, it's a tough road, right? I mean, you have a long education, you get accepted, maybe really expensive, you do a PhD, it's really, it's tough, it's a tough road. So you are at that point often, say, not motivated by money, actually. <laughs> You're motivated by the greater good somehow. And then you may stumble across something or you go really directly across, towards a particular goal that you think this will be good for humanity or for health or for sustainability, something. So I think actually many academics have this um, drive that they want to do greater good for important purpose. But then they need to realize that it's not enough just to publish a paper. You need, if you really want to push it, you need to take it much further on. And there's like a big valley in front of you <laughs> that you need to cross, and it's not easy. So you basically need to convince them, well, if you, are, if you really want your invention to, to create value, to do greater good for humanity, you need to go all that way. <laughs> and it's a difficult stretch. And somewhere along this, there has to be money involved. You cannot just do it, you know, uh, without financing, without getting the right people on board, etc. So you need to basically explain to them that in order to do, to really fulfill this purpose, you have to go all that way. I think that may be the most uh, important motivation. You probably won't be surprised that one of my solutions is an accelerator. Uh, so any sort of education program that's set up to do that helps. Uh, we teach at seven universities. And we often work with groups who are basically bridging between engineering and business. They'll bring engineers into the business classes. They'll bring the business students into the engineering. And they'll start working from a very early stage so they start understanding each other early and work towards that common goal of actually commercializing. Part of that is making sure that the folks who are doing the science understand they they, they don't know what they don't know, that there is all this business acumen out there that they're gonna be required to have. It's not like, you know, I, I've, I've, I've built it and they will come. It, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. So getting educated one way or another with, with some formal or, or moderately formal education helps. The accelerators are great because they have the community there to educate through the mentors make one quick comment, which is like exactly what you said. Two things that I love about this. One thing is, uh, unless you have a customer that's paying you, you don't have a business. And you need to explain how this is gonna become a business. So how is this, whatever it is, you're a rocket scientist, great. What you do may be rocket science and difficult, but business is not as technically difficult. So if you're smart enough to get your PhD and do what you do, you can figure it out, but you gotta put a little effort. And it's also respect, because it's a respect to the investor that you took the time. So explain to me how this is gonna be a business model that actually uh, makes money, and then you have a business. Otherwise, it's just a project. Yuval, how much time do we have? One more question? Not a lot. By the way, in Quera, we say, uh, if science were easy, we'd have marketing do it. But, <laughs> but uh, my question to you is about patient capital. I mean, quantum takes time, and it's unlikely that uh, th these companies will uh, reach maturity in two or three years. So how do you deal with that? How do you find these patient investors? Uh, thank you. <laughs> That's a very important point, and I'm very happy you asked that, because I wouldn't have. Um, OK, so I'll go first since I'm in the line. Um, so we at Kai Ventures, we, when we decided, or when Alexandra, our CEO and co-founder, uh, founded the company, she did a lot of research before. So she came from the business side where she has a science background, but she also looked at quantum and tried to understand where quantum is coming from. And it is a, a technology, oh, all three parts of it are, are technologies that are not there yet, right? So it's very unlikely that when you have a VC fund and you start investing in quantum that you will get returns in the next five years, which is what usually VCs go for. Uh, so we are lucky and fortunate enough that we have private money and we created the fund, Kai Ventures, with a timeline for return on investment of up to 16 years. 
So whenever we invest in a startup, then they have 10 years plus three times two to actually get a return. Um, and it comes with its own challenges, right? Uh, but it's needed. You, there's no way to, to invest in a startup that is doing a quantum right now and expect to them to have a huge commercial success and exit in five years. It's just very unlikely. If it happens, very good. We will be super happy, but we don't expect it, right? Uh, but because of that, I think it comes with some other challenges, and this is why when we have the fund too, we are actually going to broaden up a bit, and we started investing more in AI as well that can be applied with quantum um, and, and uh, advanced computing so that we can support ourselves and become self-sustainable during the time that we wait for the quantum projects to mature. What about you guys? So I, I worked in private equity, venture capital, but also for family offices and government, and they're all different. I would say this. Family offices can have a very long timeline because sometimes they're investing for generations. Yeah, a few of them here and there may want quick exit, so they're not your investor, right? And it's really smart that you probably educate your investor saying, hey, it's going to take 16 years. Same with think about uh, biotech. Some of those take 15, 20 years. So educate the investors to say this. But also governments have long timelines. Family offices have long timelines. So those are investors that you just have to explain how long it's going to take. And I think they're going to be good partners. So I guess for me, that's easy because I'm from a foundation which is rooted in pharma. Typical timescales in pharma are 20 years, and you need the clinical trials. So compared to that, actually, quantum is fast and easy. <laughs> I'd say the private equity is where we see a lot of that. And you'll be surprised how few early stage startups actually do take VC money. In fact, if you researched all the Fortune 500, very, a shockingly few number took VC. So it's usually angels private equity, and then also corporate alliances where they can have a joint channel partner or future. Ladies, thank you very much. If investing were easy, we'd have the scientists do it. So thank you.